this series is really designed to be uh, part lecture, part conversation. Um, the lecture portion is between uh, me and the, the panel. Today we have a very distinguished uh, uh, panelist. Um, and then afterwards, it's really to open it up the floor for questions. So if you have questions or thoughts that you want to uh, I was engaged in, uh, feel free to do that. Um, today's topic we actually, is actually a split topic. Um, it, uh, we're going to talk a bit about governance because uh, Ron Loveridge has been someone who has governed for an extended period of time and has seen a lot of changes. And I think it would be uh, interesting to get his perspective on those things. And then talk a bit about sustainability um, in uh, his next his career, his latest career. Uh, Ron is uh, working on uh, issues of, of su sustainability, particularly in a suburban context. And um, this is going to be something that is that we're going to have to deal with and think about uh, for uh, years to come as we uh, sort of build out our environment and figure out what to do with uh, the stuff that we already have. So I, I want us to start with a, with a brief introduction. Um, Ron Lovers, who is sitting here to my right, um, he served as Riverside, Riverside's mayor from 1994 to 2012. Um, before that, he was on the city council from 79 to 94. So he has been uh, a leader in the city of Riverside for a long time uh, and has seen that city evolve from um, something of a small satellite city to a city that has a, a pretty good engine of its own from the economic perspective. Um, but Ron hasn't uh, settled for just being uh, a local leader, uh, leading a city. He actually has uh, made his mark at both the state and the national level. Um, he has been on the boards of the, the League of California Cities, the California Air Resources Board, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, uh, the Southern California Association of Governments, uh, the Western Riverside Council of Governments, and the National League of Cities. Um, and in that last group, the National League of Cities, Ron served as president for an extended period of time. And with that, was able to really bring uh, prominence to uh, the issues in places like Riverside, but also in terms of how you manage it all. Um, so he has been someone who has been uh, at the forefront for a, a long time. Uh, and people have noticed. Uh, he was uh, in, inducted into the National Academy of Public Administration, uh, which is the highest honor you can have as someone uh, in our profession. And there are very few people in the, in the, in the world, actually, who uh, achieved that. Uh, and it's a, it's a special honor to have, have him with us. Um, Ron, uh, he's a political science professor at the University of California, Riverside, um, and has a PhD from Stanford. We share in that. So uh, uh, it's good to have a fellow cardinal here. Um, and, uh, I, and he also serves as an advisory board member to the Bedrosian Center. So we have also uh, adopted him into the Bedrosian family. So welcome uh, here as well. So please join me in welcoming uh, Ron Locker. So Ron, um, as I said, you've been um, doing this for a long time. And um, I wondered if you had uh, pieces of uh, pearls of wisdom as to what it takes to be uh, um, a public official, and um, if there are particular approaches or strategies you use to, to try to be effective in, in your roles. <laughs> Well, I, let me first uh, thank you for your interest uh, uh, by voting to your feet to come on this uh, this, uh, this lunchtime. Uh, it is a time uh, that uh, Los Angeles and I think all of Southern California is paying attention to this question of mayor. Uh, your first election, what is next Tuesday, and then follows by a, a, a final election in the in the, the end of. Uh, the end of May. Um, for uh, for cities, uh, uh, if you, uh, you, you sort of look at the history of cities very much as the history of mayors. It's almost like you look at the history of the United States, you sort of view it from presidential, presidential times. Uh, many ways you can do the same thing uh, cities and uh, 
and mayors. Uh, I would make the argument for cities as we, uh, counties is sort of as an abstraction, uh, state is an abstraction, uh, uh, either the states or the counties would probably look like they were now if we were uh, redrawing them uh, in 2013. Uh, but cities are different. Uh, cities are where you live. Uh, cities where experience quality of life. Uh, cities where uh, economic development takes place. And I would like to talk about cities as being the wealth of nations. And I think it's a, a reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, premise. And uh, it's also been there's my own life experience uh, that uh, if you talk to people who've been in uh, uh, different elected offices, uh, when they look back, Got, uh, uh, they identify being mayors, their favorite time in their election cycle, whatever that cycle was. Uh, and there's a reason for it. Uh, is you're, one, you're one person <coughs> rather than 15 or 7 or 40 or 80 or 100 or 435. Uh, uh, you, you, you also uh, have this ability to, uh, to see uh, direct consequences of what you do. Somebody said if you could be up in Sacramento and condemn something or cheer something, then uh, it's good to do that. It's good to advance policy. But at the local level, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, sort of empirical markers. I could say I'm against potholes. But you could walk out on the streets of Los Angeles and directly measure whether or not I've done something about potholes. I mean, there is, there, there is, you can see direct consequences of the kind of policies that, uh, that you're, you're involved with. And uh, I guess just the, uh, the in, in terms of trying to translate public policy into, uh, into uh, quality of life or economic development, I don't know of a better kind of role as possible than being mayor of a city. Uh, cities obviously differ in size. There are four million in LA. We have 300,000 or so in Riverside. The average city in California is about 50,000. I always think that people in LA need to understand there's four million people in LA and about 14 million outside. And so, uh, but in uh, many ways, the LA mayor becomes everybody's mayor because he's visible in uh, ways that uh, we are not in, in other. Uh, Cities. Uh, I just one other just uh, uh, Bob Dole, a uh, political scientist from from Yale, uh, once asked the question: What's the uh, what's the best size of a city? Uh, what, what's in terms of uh, he's looking at uh, access and uh, and resources. Uh, and this was a presidential address he gave to the uh, APSA, and his conclusion was uh, so about 250,000 people that there would be access and that there would be resources. Uh, and as he defined what would be the ideal size, or roughly the ideal size, that's a number that I think it's the size in Los Angeles of council districts. Um, but uh, Riverside fits into that general category being about uh, 300,000 that you have the ability to participate. Uh, we also have some resources to make, uh, to make, uh, to make some difference. Uh, uh, like I said, I uh, was on the city council for 14 years, mayor for 18, and, uh, and the lack of term limits allows you to have an agenda and a vision that you don't have to accomplish tomorrow because you're moving on to something else. Uh, and you can figure out how to sort of stay the course. So that's a couple of quick things. Is I, when I first decided to run for mayor, I talked to a fellow and asked him to help out in the campaign. And his question was, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do? Put that down on a piece of paper. Come back and see me. Uh, and I think it's a question if you're, that most of you are going to be helping somebody run for office, run for office yourself. Asking the question, what is it that I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? Uh, 
and you need some concepts about that. I mean, I try to see neighborhoods as important, uh, downtowns as important, social capital being important, uh, universities being important, uh, high tech being important, uh, arts and uh, arts and culture being important. But you need to have some concepts which begin to frame uh, your own kind of emphasis uh, as mayor. Uh, you can survive as mayor by not having any idea what you want to do, but all you it happens then you get pushed around by, by immediate pressures uh, and uh, whatever the kind of currents uh, of the moment. Uh, and so I think I had to identify the most important thing I think a mayor needs to do, and you can listen to the mayor candidates in LA as a sense of vision. Where do they, where do they see the city going? To, uh, uh, so I, I just, uh, Final kind of statement. It's uh, it was just it was an opportunity to uh, to serve in Riverside. I uh, was helped by the fact that uh, 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 sort of my emphasis, my what I taught was in sort of urban politics. So I I, I was familiar with the literature in addition to uh, what one could directly see and experience. So you, you asked to actually pose an interesting frame for thinking about uh, running for mayor. Um, how did you answer that question? I mean, what, 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 what did you think, think that needed to be done in Riverside that, that you wanted to accomplish? Well, I ran in 94. I was on the council before that. But uh, uh, there are a number of things that I thought really needed. The, the difficulty you face in a council uh, in, in LA is 15, and it's our city is 7, is you're all equal. So there's a, it's, you, you, you get colleagues to join you. But uh, as mayor, you can advocate some ways you cannot do as a, as a, as a, as a council member. Um, I ran on a, uh, three themes which were important in Riverside's history. Uh, it was uh, safe streets, uh, good jobs, and great neighborhoods. And so I, I organized my campaign around those thoughts of safe streets, uh, good jobs, great neighborhoods. Uh, I had a pamphlet uh, called Renewing Riverside that had some 28 action steps and uh, fairly detailed, sent it to every household. I, I really wanted it with the notion that here, here, here's who I am and I, I want to be accountable uh, for what, uh, what I'm calling out. Uh, it's a bit different when you run for the city council with your smaller districts and uh, uh, which you have the ability to uh, to knock on doors and introduce yourself, but uh, with 300,000 people, it's hard to knock on every door. For sure. Now, now, how big was the city when you when you started council? I mean, Riverside has grown quite a bit in the last. Well, it was probably 150,000 when I started. So, so it's doubled. So it's doubled. Uh, what what kind of challenges is that? that created in terms of, um, of managing and, and governing? I mean, has it, that, it's not the same city at 300 as it was at, at 150. No, well, I mean, that's, again, I, I think these are the kind of concepts that are important to me. One is that uh, was the uh, one, uh, neighborhoods were important. That's where people live, and it's really the litmus test of, of, of city services. And uh, uh, I, I asked, myself the question of what, uh, what, how can we make neighborhoods better? Um, there's a group called Neighborhoods USA that I tried to go to to pick up sort of best practice ideas elsewhere, but uh, came back and thought, I guess over time we understand 50 changes uh, about uh, neighborhoods. But as a city grows, people's identity is really with their neighborhood. They don't leave, uh, when you ask them where they live, they don't say uh, in Riverside. They don't say I live in Riverside. They live in a <laughs> certain section, certain uh, uh, neighborhood in Riverside. Uh, I believe the word of social capital is exceptionally important. I mean, I, I accept Robert Putnam's judgment that uh, life is better on almost any kind of marker or indicator than a level of social capital, which is trying to encourage community uh, engagement, uh, whether it's the community of faith or whether it's service groups or whether it's a whole variety of advocacy groups, uh, you work very hard to try to create, uh, create uh, 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 social capital. So social capital is, um, it's, it's hard. So a couple weeks ago we talked about 
um, we were talking about social justice and how communities or, or neighborhoods, or members of community neighborhoods may or may not feel like they're engaged and part of the system. Um, did you do special things to try to uh, engage and reach out to neighborhoods to, to get people to, to appreciate that they were part of a larger whole and had to sort of engage each other? One of the things I had in my initial pamphlet was a mayor's night in where people would come down and visit City Hall. I said, after a while, that's nice, but uh, maybe the mayor should go out. And so we organized uh, every month we call Mayor's Night Out. We went to we have 26 identifiable neighborhoods in the city, went to each one of those, uh, every one, of, one a month. Uh, Probably our best way we organized it, we, uh, we, you, you, you need to be at a friendly place. So you, the, the elementary schools were sort of a host. Uh, would go to an elementary school, spend some time talking to the principal and people from the district, but then would talk to members of the, uh, maybe teachers, and then we'd try to be in three or four classes. We uh, often had a luncheon where we tried to invite the, the, the neighborhood leaders, whether the PTA or, or, or neighborhood watch. Or, or else make some churches to come and talk about, and then we try to take a tour of that neighborhood, trying to get senior staff to recognize that people live in neighborhoods rather than categories of service. And, and then the evening we had a, a essentially became mayor's night out at 163 of these, and you'd invite people to uh, come, uh, very much like it's in this room, and uh, there wasn't so much hearing what we had to say, but we, uh, we, we, we listened attentively. Uh, uh, we took down the questions. We responded within 30 days. We also responded that evening. And, uh, it's trying to respect and value not the city as an abstraction, but neighborhoods as where people live. And uh, I think neighborhoods were different because we recognized them and tried to value them. And we heard different things in different places. But uh, particularly for the uh, people in charge of public works and <coughs> other things that they, they, they many times don't think about neighborhoods. And so this process got senior staff to think about neighborhoods. Now at these, at these night out events, um, I imagine people yell at you a lot. <laughs> um, how, how did you, um, your work to not have these just turn into gripe sessions where everyone feels like they, they've got to tell the mayor something and, and have it be, be pr productive or constructive. Well, a key to that was what we we take comments and then respond at the end. So you would not answer each question that came up at the time, but you, you delay until the end and then you could kind of frame your responses. But uh, <laughs> I mean, you have to sort of understand that, you, that you're not there to get people to stand up and to give you praise. People come to meetings most often because they have a problem or an issue, or, and, and uh, you, you learn uh, you, you learn how to respect. Uh, some of that is, I always thought, as a political scientist, you understand why people beat you up. You just sort of, it just sort of comes comes with. The game. It's uh, the politics is not a one, uh, not a business of unanimity. I used to often say that uh, if you win by 60 percent of the vote, that is a large margin, and people cheer it. But it means that you put 10 people behind us, there are six for me and four against. So it is when you're making choices, or, uh, not everybody agrees with the choices that are, that are being made. Well, I have to say that that's that's very true. You know, I was. Uh, as, as an assistant secretary at HUD, um, when I would go out and meet with constituents, you know, the first, we used to do it in two hour blocks. The first hour was the get yelled at hour, right? And just let people yell, because as you say, people don't come because they're happy. They come because they're frustrated about something. And then get to these other things, and it does, it took for me a little adjustment to answer. You want to answer each question, you want to respond, but sometimes it's better just to, to try to get to summary statements that are actually quite quite interesting. Yeah, okay. it, it, most students are interested in government at what happens in, uh, in Washington, D.C. or Sacramento, and uh, the access that people have to, uh, to uh, the state and national governments is pretty modest. I mean, you can do an email or send a check-in or, or mail it. TV set, but it's uh, 
it's a pretty modest kind of engagement. Uh, at the local level, uh, uh, the, the language of access, I think, is probably the single most valuable thing about local politics, is you have access. You can come. Uh, I, I used to make the uh, comment to high school classes that if you, if, you're, if your high school teacher said you've got to go talk to the President of the United States, have a five-minute face-to-face conversation with the President, uh, you might have been able to do it, but how, 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 how do you do it? And uh, high school students would wander around a lot before they could figure out they need to network and figure it out. I mean, uh, and my answer was that you probably could talk to a congressman if you, know, you could maybe set something up. But the contrast was, you want to talk to the mayor of Riverside, how did you do it? You came to City Hall, or you come to council, it means everybody who comes can speak for three minutes, doesn't, uh, on any subject. And, uh, they, you have, you have access at, at the local level uh, in ways you do not have at the, at the state and, uh, and, and federal level. So um, I don't know if you all saw uh, in yesterday's LA Times, uh, there was an article by, a, a column, actually an editorial by uh, Mike Wu talking about uh, what makes a good mayor. And he calls out Four mayors in particular um, as saying that the mayor candidates should look to successful mayors um, uh, and try to learn the lessons that they've learned. He calls out Mike Bloomberg from New York, uh, Richard Daly from Chicago, Adrian Fenty from uh, Washington, and then Ron Lovers from Riverside. And um, the, 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 the aspect of Ron that, that uh, Mike uh, Wu, who was the, the, the editorial writer, uh, highlighted was um, using it, your seat on the Regional Air Board and presidency of the National League of Cities uh, to make a difference for constituents. Uh, you, many mayors and council members stick to the neighborhood, stick to their city. You chose not to. You chose to be on these regional boards, take leadership position in state and national organizations. What was your thinking behind that? And what did it allow you to do that you don't think you would have otherwise? I guess really three, three things. One, uh, uh, I, I think if you're serious about this business of mayor, you have to look at best practices, and best practices are found outside your own, your own, uh, your own city, city limits. Uh, second, uh, the, the, the city's strength comes from being together. So. Uh, the issues which Sacramento takes up or DC takes up, uh, uh, cities need to be a participant in those discussions. And I, I found the policy discussions at the state and federal level intellectually and personally and politically engaging. And I guess the, the third is that uh, you're able to kind of connect uh, with what uh, you're doing at the state level, at the federal level, with what is taking place in your own city. Some of it's lessons, some of it's contact, some of it's telling stories. Uh, and uh, uh, this, in 2012, uh, the city of Riverside, which uh, most of you have probably seen because you drive down the freeway heading to, uh, heading to the desert or someplace that we, we don't see Main Street much anymore. You see exits, uh, freeway sign exits. Uh, uh, so, but this last year, uh, Riverside was chosen as the 2012 uh, Intelligent Community of the Year. We competed against 435 cities around the world. Uh, uh, Austin, uh, we had a final in seven cities. One was Austin, Texas. We had three from Canada, one from Finland, and one from uh, Taiwan. Riverside was was selected, but, and uh, but the ability to compete in part came from understanding what was happening outside your city limits and what kind of choices and opportunities there were. So that's that's actually really interesting. And you know, I will, I'm wondering, because um, I'm engaged in this in a whole host of other areas, um, this question of best practices. 
and figuring out what the best way to do things is um, when all the cities are trying to do the same things. Right? Did you have trusted sources? Were there, were there the types of um, either organizations or colleagues that you had who you thought were, were really insightful and could give you things that were helpful? I mean, eventually you became that for many people. Uh, but as you were starting to engage, were there folks that, or organizations that you turned to? Well, that's why you know the League of Cities, California Cities, and the, uh, the National League of Cities bring people together, and you have conferences and meetings, and so some of the best and brightest, so to speak, are, are you can find uh, these uh, meetings and uh, and, uh, and and conferences. So at least. Uh, you know, the public has this sort of notion if you go go someplace, it's some kind of junket. You're taking trips to different places. Uh, uh, but I, I tried to have a, at least a commitment to bring back three to five ideas after every place I went to. So you, you and so you begin to see what translates, what uh, areas which you might strengthen something you're doing, or have the city go in a different direction. And, uh, and, and, I mean, it, this one I was at a, a meeting in Orlando, and uh, there was a called Orlando Clean and Beautiful. And, uh, there was a, I heard, so this is kind of an interesting conversation. To, uh, uh, went and talked to the executive director, got an understanding of how it's funded, and kind of an executive board supported that, and uh, took the idea back to the city of Riverside. It is now our premier signature volunteer effort. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of people every year involved. So they raise quite a bit of money, do all kinds of good stuff. Came from listening to somebody talk about a program in the city and say, we don't have it, it can work. So that, that's that's um, actually really interesting because um, I think many folks don't view these conferences as opportunities to get bring new ideas, but they do view them as junkets. Um, but that's a, probably another conversation to have. Um, but it, but it, your clean and beautiful initiative actually uh, is a nice segue, I think, to talk about the other topic, which is sustainability. And um, now you are the director of the Center for Suburban Sustainable Development at UCR, uh, which is a center that's funded by Ali Sahabi initially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, talk, talk, you know, I'll have to say, this is my little soapbox issue. Um, when you talk about sustainability, the first question I have is what is it? And, and, and what's, what's the definition of sustainability that we're trying to, to chase? Um, how, are, how is your center, and how do you think about sustainability um, when, when you talk about it? Well, yeah, it, it's sort of taken off in different directions, but the, and I've only now been with this less than a quarter, so i uh, uh, but the original concept was that uh, had to do with really the inland uh, Southern California. Um, uh, by 2060, the uh, second largest county in California in population is going to be Riverside County. By 2060, the third largest county in California is going to be San Bernardino County. So you have this, this push, this growth of population. To, uh, and I think we're you know, often judged to be uh, the world-class example of sprawl. That was the, uh, that uh, too much of the, uh, the housing was built in the cities that were uh, emerging to, uh, were not particularly respectful of, uh, of the future. And so I think that the, the sustainability origins of the center was that uh, as this particularly inland region grew, it, that uh, it, it should ask questions about environment and, and health and uh, uh, the water and air and transportation and try to see these sort of as an integrated part of its future rather than sort of segmented, uh, segmented issues. And you talk about, I mean your center is specifically called suburban development. Uh, What's the difference between that and urban? I mean, what, what are, how, how do the, the issues differ and, and what sorts of uh, alternative approaches do you have to use? 
Well, we used to have nice distinctions between urban and suburban. I think uh, the general agreement that those distinctions are, are becoming quite fused together, and uh, uh, the, the, the ethnic separations or the income separations uh, just are, are not uh, not there. And so we are we've sort of beginning to move away from from focusing on suburban and emphasizing sustainability. And so, but again, the origins of this was because of this uh, growth that was going to occur. In the, in the inland area. And, uh, it used to be the old saw that if you wanted to f f f uh, find affordable house in Los Angeles, you just got on the freeway and kept driving until you could afford to pay for a house. And so a lot, of, lot, a lot of people ended up in the high deserts and other places for that, for that reason. And, and uh, the, well, clearly you do think that there's a, a way to be sustainable in these environments. Um, are, is there low-hanging fruit that we should be running to, like now, or like, like what should we be doing? What, what can we be doing today to, to advance sustainability? Well, there used to be a concept of smart growth that I thought was sort of at, it's at the boundaries. It's now conventional wisdom. Uh, there, uh, many of the design notions of new urbanism, I think, now are part of the uh, part of the kind of policy uh, policy uh, discussions. Um, uh, but I think for Southern California, the the the, the single most important opportunity that uh, in my in my really lifetime is been, is framed by the SCAG's Regional Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy. It's by everyone's account and judgment the best plan that Southern California has. Um, it was adopted unanimously by groups, whether it was BIA or the National Resource Defense Fund. Uh, everybody cheered the plan. Now you have to do something with it in terms of implementing it. And so, yeah. I, I was afraid that was me. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. So, so, <laughs> persistent call. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, important. Um, so, c can you summarize that plan, like at, at a very high level? I don't know if everyone has actually um, read it. Yeah. I bet you almost nobody <laughs> uh, has has read it. But SCAG is Southern California Association of Governments. It's a uh, uh, these are sort of, uh, and the regional transportation plan is something the federal government requires. Uh, and it's been, I've gone through a number of these. It's sort of a ritual that uh, the regions go through. But uh, this year it was not a ritual uh, uh, because it, it had something else connected with it, which was something that uh, Daryl Steinberg, who's the president pro tem, has uh, seen, I think, as a sort of leg legacy in Sacramento. Uh, it was SB 375, and we wanted to have a, a, a reduction in greenhouse gases. That is, began to focus this question on urban form, really, for the first time in Southern California. What, what should Southern California look like? Uh, and how does it reduce, how does it begin to reduce the uh, uh, trips taken and, uh, and, and uh, I, I think for so talking about real estate, I, I, it is really an, what, what, there, there, there's such the old American dream of the uh, you went out and lived in the suburbs and had the house and so on and so forth. Picket picket fence. What? Only one out of five Americans now lives in a, 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 a husband and wife and, and, and kids at home. I mean that. Uh, uh, so there, there's so many other different choices are being made, uh, uh, and so in terms of housing and, uh, and density and uh, urban characteristics, uh, I, I think it's uh, it's 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 an exciting to exciting time. I, you know, it's, the other thing is you, you look outside today out at the windows. If you were looking outside the windows. Um, Say uh, 40 years ago, uh, you wouldn't. Well, you'd maybe be able to see the trees, but probably not much else. Uh, uh, that is, the air is much cleaner, and it's it, it, and that happened because of a lot of decisions. Something called the 
uh, the South Coast uh, Air Quality Management District made. Uh, you know, ozone is, is I mean, uh, it, it just dramatic changes. And I only do that because I think we're, we're at a place where we, we can figure out how to begin to make some interventions in this, uh, this extraordinary place where we live that uh, this is the time to do it. I mean, there's some, once thing that the city is Riverside's about to adopt, which many cities have, is called complete streets, where you try to think streets are not simply places for cars, they're also places for pedestrians and bikes, and uh, thinking about the, the different uses the street can have other than having cars go up and down them. I, I, th I think it's an exceptionally exciting time, and looking at urban form, uh, and, and especially urban form in, uh, in, uh, in Southern California. You have a major builder called the Van Dales in Riverside, and uh, they uh, were fellows doing some uh, reconstruction of apartment complexes and, uh, in, in Los Angeles. was talking about how exciting this was of, 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 of sort of reinventing and redoing and, uh, uh, apartment complexes to make them more livable. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a you know, it's, 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 I think uh, it's an exciting time uh, to try to take ideas now which are accepted and try to make urban life in Southern California uh, different. Well, two thoughts on that, and, and we're going to go to questions in just a moment, so you, if you have them, start formulating them. Um, one, you know, many talk about California as being a bellwether state in terms of engaging in these policy areas. So. Um, the California emissions, all the clean air things, they originated here and really emerged out of the crisis that you were talking about uh, when asthma and just health was threatened by, by air quality. Uh, and then the second thing is your complete streets. That's going on in this neighborhood. So the more and more streets even around here uh, have the bike lanes and are trying to accommodate multiple modes. So we're seeing it emerge, you know, this yeah. thing that you're talking about. In many contexts, you know, all over. Well, there's bike. There's, you know, if you go to the city hall and, and, and uh, Long Beach, right above the side of the title of City Hall is, is the most bicycle-friendly city in the United States. Or I guess America, most bicycle-friendly city in America. That's that's their audacious call attached to City Hall. Uh, but I, it's, uh, I, I think the the. the the urban form is, I mean, it used to be uh, drivable suburban, you know, now walkable urban. There are multiple choices. Uh, I think uh, it's just an exciting time to be in this city governance business. And with that, are there questions, thoughts people have? Uh, just two, two rules. First, introduce yourself when you ask a question. Second, um, ask a question in a manner that you'd like someone to ask you a question. So that's it. Yes. Hi, my name is Yolanda Delapaz. I'm a first year public policy student at the Price School. And I'm wondering, Riverside's new because I have a very large public university, UC Riverside. And I'm wondering if the university had any role in kind of the change you've seen in the city <coughs> since you first took office there. Very, very good question. Uh, uh, a fellow named James Rouse was, uh, was one of the people often talked about and thought about a lot about urban reform. Uh, uh, when I first was elected to the city council, I heard him speak, and he said, What you need to do in a city is ask what are its assets, what are its primary assets, and then use them to advance the city. Well, Riverside's primary asset is we have uh, University of California, Riverside. We have two private universities, uh, California Baptist University, La Sierra. We have a community college. We estimate maybe 65,000, 70,000 students in the city. It's the single most important characteristic of Riverside. It, it differs, the reason would differ from many other, many other places. Uh, and. Uh, Mayor, I worked very, very hard to have the closest possible relationships with all four campuses. Uh, someone pointed out Orange County only has three universities in all of Orange County. We have three in our city. Um, uh, and 
you know, for, for universities, they want to be places of choice for students and faculty and staff. Um, in many ways, that's the same thing you want to do. Uh, uh, it's not without its critics, but uh, Richard Florida is probably the person that's often cited uh, as a notion of a creative class. He's, he used to be at Carnegie in Chicago. He's now. Uh, or at Carnegie in, in Pittsburgh. He's now at, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Canada, Toronto. But uh, uh, I mean, he identifies the, the successful cities or cities that uh, were places where the creative class likes to be. And uh, you, you, you're all prospective members of the, or current members of the creative class. Uh, but universities help provide a kind of dynamic for that in terms of uh, cultural offerings, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, interests that uh, students and, and, and faculty have. Uh, you know, in the old days, the, uh, just, you know, you had smokestacks which you cheered on. I think most people talk about eds and meds and then the universities and medical schools and so forth are, are now the places that uh, characterize successful urban to urban cities. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure what Riverside would be like if we didn't have three universities and community colleges. a great asset. So uh, just because as some people know, we have in, our, in high school, Elizabeth Curry, who works on many of these uh, issues around the creative class and their role in economics. Uh, she's worked with Richard Florida, and <coughs> it is something, I think it's an emerging field that more and more people are going to pay attention to, so it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, right here in the front. Hi, uh, David, what's your last year uh, when I was in high school? Uh, as you noted, there are significant trends So what do those communities, do you think those, the roles of those communities are starting to change and what should these suburban communities do to kind of stay relevant and still serve the purpose? Some of this is just obviously market, market, the market's changing. I mean, the, uh, what, uh, the old shopping mall, which we went inside where everything looked like everything else, is no longer as interesting as it used to be, and why uh, it's more intense, intense uh, urban uh, urban retail uh, becomes more uh, more uh, more interesting. Um, uh, you listen to people who are, who are not doing small projects but large projects. Uh, Randall Lewis is an example of, uh, in our, our, our way, and uh, he has kind of a smart city notion of what uh, what new development should be look like. And so, the, even even the newest stuff that's being built uh, has some different premises that are around its uh, planning and uh, and, uh, and construction. Um, but. I, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is sort of seeing possibilities that I think one of the major roles that universities have and, uh, is to try to introduce concepts, uh, not simply to themselves, but to, to, the, to the larger community. Um, uh, part of it is uh, one of the things that I'm doing in the uh, center is we're trying to take a Faculty members done some interesting research and then have a luncheon in which we invite outsiders to come and listen and talk to the faculty member. Uh, 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 again, too much of university research has sort of stayed in house and hasn't uh, hasn't been diffused. Uh, so we've got to figure out how to, how to do that. No, I, I, I'm trying to do the same thing, so <laughs> we, we can commiserate. The, the other, Randall Lewis uh, often comes to campus, uh, the high school in Lewis Hall. Um, that's a close relation. We'll just, just say that. Um, uh, next question. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ben Robinson. I'm a first year master's public policy student. Um, so the main issue from, that I see in sustainability is not necessarily the sprawl in regions, but the fragmentation in regions. So you see regions as large as Southern California have large amounts of municipalities, even smaller regions like Pittsburgh or Chicago, which are the most desperate, or I guess disparate, in the amount of these problems they have. There's a lot of coordination issues and strategy issues involved in that, too. So why should my community do sustainability if the other community isn't? 
That's my resource that I could be using to remain competitive with another group, another municipality. And there's all these wars going on within regions. So how do we get disparate, disparate communities to have the shared interests when regions are so large and so separate? I use a text by uh, Dennis Judd and uh, Todd Swanson called uh, Urban, Urban Politics, and they have three uh, uh, major characteristics of urban politics. One is the, is the pursuit of, uh, of economic prosperity, the second is the, the challenge of governance, the third is extreme uh, fragmentation of the metropolitan region. Um, Your observation is really quite correct. Some of the cities and the counties and cities and special districts, and uh, we've uh, we divide ourselves up in, in many different uh, governance ways that uh, are very difficult to track and to follow to be to be informed about. Uh, there, there was a a major effort and it's been successful some places to try to kind of find cities and counties and have a region which is one governing structure but uh, as you might imagine uh, different it's not going to happen very popular and uh, Riverside would not doesn't think having LA make its decisions would be good for uh, good for uh, good for uh, good for Riverside um, that's uh, two things I, that's why I think the SCAG effort which is sort of kind of a System-wide kind of look is 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 important. Uh, the other is that, uh, 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 and I, here it's very hard for the mayor of Riverside to call a meeting of Southern California to get to come together. The mayor of LA can. Uh, uh, current mayor, or now he's governor of, 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 of mayor of Denver, Hickenlooper, when he be, had his election night, he invited all the mayors of the surrounding suburban cities to come to his election night. Uh, and he's made an effort, to, or he's mayor, to, to have conversations. Uh, I recognize that LA is a very difficult place to govern, and there's four million people, and, uh, but I think there's a role for the mayor of LA of, of, of extending to this himself to think about what happened in the region. In our own area, I always make the point, in the seven years that Antonio's been mayor, there's never been a sighting of Antonio in the, inland, uh, the two inland counties that I know of. He may have driven through, but uh, uh, he was there actually as a funeral of an officer last uh, two weeks ago. But uh, I, I think if I had any request for the new mayor of LA is that, that in terms of trying to bring people together, the mayor of LA can do that. Uh, uh, he can make the call, I think we'd come, but uh, or she could, if she makes the call, we would come. But, uh. Yes. Hi, I'm Austin. I'm a freshman majoring in, <coughs> excuse me, political science and environmental studies. Uh, what role do you see party politics play in local government? Uh, you know, the, the old sources know Republican or Democratic way to, 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 to fill a to, to fill a pothole. Uh, it, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, I uh, I'm a Bob Kennedy Democrat in, in an area which is almost entirely a red area. It's had, to, I mean, until recently we never had any kind of elected Democrats in state office or or, or, or federal office. Um, but you don't ask that question very much at the local level. What party, party, party identification? Well, we had a city manager one time, and I asked him, do you, know the, do you know the party identifications of the members of the council? He knew five. He thought he knew six. And seven, he said, I didn't have a guess. Uh, and the point is that uh, in, in terms of what you do, uh, within a city, there, there, there isn't much by way of, of division by, by, by party ideology. Um, where party becomes important is when you have to get resources outside the city, if you have to go to Sacramento, or you have to go to Washington, suddenly parties become, uh, and your connection with parties become somewhat important. But within, within the city, within dynamics, we have, and, uh, and Riverside City Council had one very conservative Republican member of the uh, council. We had another very liberal Democratic 
member of the council, and on most issues, they're together because great streets and good jobs and great neighborhoods sort of bring you to a core. And I think most of the people who look at mayors find them being pragmatic because of the choices that uh, the context in which they find themselves. And uh, uh, this question of compromise is it, I mean, if you watch what's happening in Washington and you kind of wonder, uh, but if you don't compromise at the local level, you don't get anything done. Yes. Hi, my name is Ryan Cassett. I'm a first year public policy student, a uh, master's student. And uh, my question is sort of building off the last question. Uh, you mentioned that Riverside is a little bit more conservative. Uh, it's also much more suburban. How do you sell sustainability given these uh, different political uh, challenges? Well, I, we regard ourselves as a green city. We Last year, uh, we were competing uh, in our, there were three population categories in the United States, and the, the middle one, uh, there was Santa Monica, Riverside, and Jersey City. It was a, uh, we didn't win, Santa Monica won, but we were uh, competing with the, with the greenest. I, I, I didn't see green as being an ideological thing. I think, uh, um, um, I, I think part of the, the argument you make is you, by going green, you save green. But, um, I'm teaching a class in the spring, and I, my premise of the class is that the most interesting progressive cities are green cities. Uh, I'm not sure that's a uh, that's a, a right or left call. I think it's uh, how people see uh, their city and their, their aspirations for it. Uh, um, but uh, being green, I think, is is, is a ch cities that you choose to live in. If you'd like to live in, uh, emphasize. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that last year we were chosen as the the, the number one uh, green fleet in the country. Uh, we had uh, almost 100 percent of our non-public safety vehicles are alternative fuel in some way. Uh, but I, 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 I think. The, Sustainability, I mean, if maybe if you talk about climate change and so forth, but sustainability has more uh, direct consequences uh, uh, and opportunities uh, for, uh, for cities. And, and we have seen in some instances you know, a premium placed on green features for, for buildings and for, for uh, hiring and, and those sorts of things. So, so it's definitely something that may be more generic uh, have gen more generic implications for bottom line that would transcend party politics, um, which is an interesting, interesting proposition. I, th there's a whole lot more data that needs to be developed on this um, as to you know, what features really do translate into real green versus you know, um, window dressed green. Um, but but it is, it's an important issue um, that I think everyone's starting to grapple with. Other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Joshua Goldman. I'm working on my Master's of Public Administration, second year of Earth Price School. And I was wondering, you were talking about when you ran for city council, you were working with someone else. And a lot of my friends run for city council. They all failed terribly. Um, what allies would you suggest us trying to seek out if we're running for council? And we really want to get elected, because obviously I don't run like, hey, I don't want to get elected. We really want to get elected. Who should we ally with? Running for election is serious business for your own time, for your family, for your friends, and so it, I think it does need to be a, a serious, serious choice. Uh, council is a bit different from for mayor, which uh, it's a larger mayor is a larger, uh, obviously constituency. Uh, uh, one of the things that. Uh, I taught at UCR was campaign politics, and so when I ran for uh, city council, I, I ransacked every text I had and tried to pull out what I thought things that uh, made uh, made sense. Uh, one of the, the first things I did when I ran for the council, I did a poll to see how many people knew who I was, and, uh, and in this case, we had 226 people, and I was well liked by 12, disliked by one. 
Their others had no idea who I was. <laughs> and so it reminded me, and I thought I had modest visibility, it reminded me, you know, campaign is you have to tell your story. Um, most, in most cities, if city, average city in California is 50,000, you're not talking about the scale of, of, of Los Angeles. Knocking on doors is the single most important thing you can do. I mean, by research, the knock on the door by the candidate, uh, uh, it changes, mainly part of this, most people don't do it. Uh, uh, but it, 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 and I think I knocked on something like 4,500 doors or 5,000 doors, uh, wore out a couple pair of shoes, uh, and uh, was, uh, was, uh, was different also because of it. Each time you knock on a door, you listen to a life story. Uh, and uh, you talk about it, and uh, actually that person calls you up again. You, you had this memory of the person you talked to, what the street was like, and maybe what the problem was like. Uh, it's interesting, my uh, first campaign for uh, city council, Jim Brulte was the, uh, the, was the political consultant for my main opponent. And, uh, Interesting. And, uh, was about ready to be the head of the Republican Party in the state of California. Uh, but you won anyway. Well, yeah, knocking on doors. Uh, uh, what, you know, you, you, you get people to the kitchen table. You have to raise some money because you have to do the, use mail or uh, to, to make some kind of contact. Uh, I often saw yard signs as being quite important because they're not they're not hung up on a, on a vacant lot, but they're put in person's yard. There's. There, that, that person's saying, I, I, I know this person, and I want you to vote for him. Uh, uh, it, it, I think local politics is friends and neighbors politics, and, uh, and, and uh, there's a ripple effect from, from contacts. And uh, uh, you can hold coffees, which, I mean, there's a serious, uh, always like when Clint Eastwood ran for mayor of, uh, of Carmel. So he had a coffee for every 35 voters in the city of, uh, of Carmel. And, uh, and I met him through, through coffees. But uh, local politics allows you to, to, to make, you know, you're not on television. You're not on, you know, it's not, radio, it's not television or radio game. It's, it's, a, it's a field game, uh, I think, for council. Uh, and you also need to have something while you're running. You need to have some, uh, some sense of how you want to make the, the neighborhood or the community uh, 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 a better place. Now, you were the mayor for 18 years. Um, you never ran, did you, did you ever think about running for governor or county supervisor? Uh, uh, well, I'd much rather be a mayor than a supervisor, but uh, I, the, I, I was a Democrat in, uh, in a Republican lake, as I was describing. There was no, there was no Democrats within the sideline of Riverside, so I, the, uh, the, we're just not a... Just wasn't in the cards. Just wasn't in the cards. So. Locally, as you know, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, I assume everybody at Salt High School knows about Hiram Johnson, the uh, first pro progressive governor of California, who brought all these kind of political changes. Uh, but one of the changes that Hiram Johnson and, uh, and others brought in the progressive change was you have no party, there's no party identification when you run for local office. So uh, there's not a, a, a Democrat or Republican. And so it, you, you part removes you from the, the kind of uh, judgment that somehow there's a Democratic or Republican vote. Any, any last questions? Yes, we have one over here. Hi, uh, my name is Elena Santigo. I'm a first year planning student at the high school. I also have the honor of taking a class with uh, Professor Leverage. Uh, I was wondering, you know, Riverside and other large cities like Long Beach were kind of they're seen as bedrooms, or were previously seen as bedrooms for LA. And kind of surrounding areas built for LA. Has that harmed sustainability in more local cities, not LA? And you see that idea of that these really large cities that in other places would be considered urban, their own urban areas. You see a movement away from them as suburbs and more towards uh, independent cities that are partner with LA rather than a suburb. Well, I, I, I don't think, and it's true for most metropolitan regions, the old notion there's a central city and there's suburbs and everybody that works in the central city goes home to the suburbs is, is um, there may be an example of that around, but they're not 
Middle East. Mainly Middle East. Middle East. Middle East. Uh, one of the books that I thought was helpful in trying to understand that is a book by uh, Joel Garreau called uh, Edge Cities, and the idea that if you look at where, where, where employment is in Southern California, it's, 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 you know, there's, what, there's many more office jobs in the Irvine than there is in downtown LA, that, that, that the, the, the economic energy is, is, is located in different places. Uh, and I know most cities of any size, uh, what we talk a lot about is jobs and how do you, how do you bring jobs to your own to your, uh, we have Riverside there's something like 160,000 jobs in the city and so we actually import people to, to work in the city but I think uh, you, you're seeing uh, manufacturing and office uh, uh, it's, it's sort of spread out to a region rather located in, in one central central city. Okay, um, then, then we'll, we'll wrap up here. I, I, I did want to close with um, ask, asking you one thought about um, some advice. Actually, it's two thoughts. My thoughts always multiply. Um, the first thought was for um, Advice for the mayor, for an incoming mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, you talked about going to Riverside and actually being seen there. Uh, and, 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 but is there another one? And then the second is for the students. And for, you know, there, there are a number of students here who think about uh, taking this stuff seriously. Uh, what advice would you give to them as they think about um, their futures uh, post school and how to be successful and effective? Well, the, for the mayor of LA, I, I, I mean, LA is a world-class city, and it seems to me you need to frame the mayor's campaign in that in that kind of context. I I, I recognize people want to have potholes filled, but it seems to me that this this is the driver for the city itself, it's the driver for the region. I, you come out of LAX, and there was a sign that, uh, that says that this is this city with more creative people any place in the world. It, it, Southern California is an extraordinary place. I think you need to have some extraordinary ideas as you're running in. You also need to take those ideas out to the provinces, not simply to downtown. But uh, I mean, for students, uh, uh, a couple a couple ideas. One, I think almost all of you are going to be involved in some political campaign, whether for yourself or your friends, and. Uh, uh, campaigning is a little bit like an art form, uh, well, it's, there's a science, but, uh, but there's a, to, to understand it, you've got to participate. And so, but not simply handing something out at a shopping center, but trying to get kind of close to a campaign. And if you can't be in the, at the kitchen table, at least uh, be a part of the organization. I really encourage one to do that, and test oneself out. Uh, and. Uh, uh, if you want to run for office, uh, it, it, the question, will you vote for me, uh, is, uh, some people are better at fancying that question than others, and uh, you can maybe you can, you can sort of, uh, it's a great puzzle of how you do it. Uh, uh. The other, my own experience is that internships, that, that where you have a chance to, uh, to, uh, to take concepts from the classroom and see how they work and where you, uh, you're interning is really, really important. Uh, uh, I think often students don't meet everything that professors want to do, and you find out when you're an intern, hey, I'm good, I can do things, people value me, and I have uh, uh, I've just, uh, I just wrote an email to a uh, fellow named Mike Huerta, who is, uh, is now head of the Federal Aviation Administration, and uh, he, uh, he comments he got started in this because I, he was an intern at the redevelopment agency in the city of Riverside. Uh, uh, he also did something that uh, he, uh, he interned uh, for a s equivalent of a semester with Drew University and, uh, and uh, New York at the United Nations. Uh, uh, Mike Porter was hired by Ed Koch to be the head of the uh, New York Port Authority, or the youngest person, I guess, that had been hired in New York. I, mean, he said, he, I think you've got to take some risk 
uh, uh, and extend yourself. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things I think students do not do enough of and it's, uh, is that if you, I, I, I found I could place a student anywhere I wanted to if I made the call and said, this, you know, I feel it's really good and he has promise and can you, can you, as long as you don't have to ask and get paid, you can get placed. You need to, you have some extraordinary folk here at, at USC, uh, talk to them and say, I'd like to intern in, work, and they most likely can get you there. Summertime, you just have to do it, but I think that's one of the great things about Los Angeles is you've got all these choices that the, the, the school can help you get connected with, and I'd really recommend you think about that in addition to doing good work in the classroom. And if I could amend that, um, just to say one thing, be specific. Like, I want to work someplace, right? Don't say I want to work in the field, and, uh, and that, that's very helpful. So, so seeing organizations or people who are ins inspiring or inspirational, uh, and then trying to get hooked up with them um, is important. But you need to have some sense of who those folks are uh, moving forward. Yeah, just if you read the LA Times today, Wendy Gruel, that she got excited by political life by working for Tom Bradley. And that was the Tom Bradley experience, which sort of became the defining experience for her. But it was not because she lived in San Fernando Valley, but she came down to City Hall. Right, exactly right. So I'm getting signals I need to wrap up. So, so let me do this very quickly. I, I wanted to just leave with a couple of thoughts for you uh, to walk out of here with. First, um, we heard Ron's campaign wisdom knocking on doors, yard signs, and I liked um, the notion of friends and neighborhood, neighbors politics. Uh, politics is interpersonal, and we are in the social space, so don't forget that it's not all TV and radio and slick ads. You actually do need to connect with people. Uh, a second thing is Southern California as a place of opportunity and experimentation. Uh, throughout our hour together, we've, we've heard a number of different examples of how good ideas uh, and interesting uh, approaches have started here and have become uh, the standard for our country. And then um, the third thing I just wanted to say is, um, it's really a function of who Ron is, um, we've talked a lot today about ideas. Right, Ron is, is a doer, he's been a mayor, a council person, and president of all these things, uh, but he's also a thinker and is looking for ideas and recognize, tries to find good ideas and find ways to, to bring them home and make them real. Um, he, he reads, he, he's urban politics, Ed Cities, other books. Um, thinking matters, and it's a, it's a good re reminder uh, for those of us who could otherwise be cynical that thoughtful people uh, in places where they can actually make change can do great things. So thank you for that, um, that reminder. Um,